he was an educator uh, before anything else about wildlife and its environment. Hello there. I'm glad you could join us again today. Ginger, when you lived in the jungles in South America... Tonight, a special presentation on the life and legacy of Marlon Perkins. When I first met Marlon, I thought he was not the rugged outdoor kind of guy I was used to. But he, as they say, he would do to ride the river with. Funding for the Zoo Man has been provided by the Arthur and Helen Bear Foundation and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding has been provided by Jane Hunter McMillan. For more than 40 years, Marlon Perkins led a multitude of fascinated people through swamps, forests, and jungles. He brought to them images, extraordinary images, of wild animals in their natural environments. As explorer, adventurer, and teacher, he influenced young people who could not even imagine the responsibility that lay before them. Audiences around the world know Marlon Perkins as the dauntless explorer, the overseer of the Wild Kingdom. But his principal story is truly that of a zoo man. I've gone to the gorillas and climbed the Virungas, you know, when I'm old enough to know better than to do that and go to Borneo and find the orangutans is because these were trips that Marlon and I were going to make and we ran out of time. Uh -huh. And so I'm making them. Yeah. And I, I didn't realize that right at first, that instead of going to Vienna for the season or something, I was off climbing to find the gorillas it's all Marlon's fault. I'm, I'm still, still following up, you know, and doing the things we intended to do. In 1993, three generations of the Perkins family returned to Africa to share the legacy that Marlon had left to them. It was a momentous safari, one that would symbolize all that Marlon had attempted to achieve in his life. Marlon didn't really care who you were. I mean, everybody was the same to him. Whether you were president of the United States or whether you were a four-year-old you know, child, he would take the same time with you. Uh, which brings about a story that when he and I were in Illinois one time doing a program, uh, we were 
running a little bit late. We were hurrying through this mall to get to this particular area where we were going to do a program on conservation that evening. And a, a young boy ran out and said, well, I know you. He said, you're Marlon Perkins. I've seen you on Wild Kingdom. And Marlon said, well, yes. And he said, well, I have a question. Marlon bent over and, and talked to the young boy for about four or five minutes, much to the chagrin of everybody else who was in a big hurry. And uh, after he was done, he, you know, the young boy thanked him, and, and we went on our way. And he turned to me and he said, you know, Walt, he said, right there's the answer. He said, it's the kids. He said, if we don't reach the kids, we're not going to save the future. He said, if you remember anything I tell you, remember that. As a child on a farm in the Missouri Ozarks, Marlon knew that understanding nature meant exploring it, and he wanted to know everything about every creature. He writes in his autobiography, My Wild Kingdom, I'd follow the hired hand when he was plowing and watch the creatures that were uncovered by the plow. Well, as, as I was signing the papers, they informed me that Marlon Perkins lived here as a boy and that he had been born here. There's a little room in the basement with a chain sunk into the wall. And uh, my son looked at it and said, my goodness, mother, they must have put someone in here and chained them up. And I said, I doubt it. It was a minister's residence. But there was also iron bars on the door and on the little window. And then later, uh, he told me that's where he kept his animals. I was always a little afraid of him because he always had some kind of a, a little insect or something in his pocket. And uh, I never would, he always wanted to uh, reach in his pocket, but I never would because I know there would probably be a snake down there. He was quite a guy. And uh, the lady across the street, uh, Mrs. Hohen, informed me that the most terrible little boy used to live there. She was, I think, maybe 94. And she said, uh, when I was younger, this, this little child was there. And she said, you couldn't afford to let him close to you. He had mice and rats and just anything was in his pockets. And then I put two and two together and realized that that had to be Marlon. At an early age, Marlon began surrounding himself with living creatures. But at the age of seven, he would learn the sorrow that accompanies the end of life when he lost his beloved mother. Years later, he recalled running around and around the house, crying, I want my mother, I want my mother, as though by hurrying he might in some way catch up with her. Marlon's life turned out quite differently from the prediction beneath his name in the Carthage High School yearbook. It reads, maybe someday he'll own a stock farm. But soon his passion for life and his vision of the future would take him in another direction. He didn't want to work with cattle. He wanted to learn about wild animals and share that knowledge. He wanted to be a zoo man. Marlon went to the St. Louis Zoo to convince George Verheller, the director, to hire him. When Verheller offered Marlon a job sweeping the sidewalks for $3.25 a day, Marlon was elated. Director Verheller saw something special in this young man, and in a few months, Marlon was curator of reptiles, a position he held and loved for 11 years. This to Marlon was heaven. When Marlon first came to the St. Louis Zoo, this building, the Herpetarium, didn't exist. Actually, he kept a private collection of reptiles in the antelope house where he was working as a keeper. And because of his interest in reptiles, he talked to the zoo director at the time and helped design this building. And it houses one of the world's largest collectors of reptiles and amphibians. Marlin's ingenuity also applied to the more mundane aspects of a young man's life in the 1920s. There are a lot of stories hidden in this reptile house about Marlon Perkins. All the keepers in the days, Moody Lentz, Marlon Perkins, they kept their money, their valuables after payday. They were always paid in cash. And they hid it in a little bag under a rock in the, in the rattlesnake's cage because they knew it was safe from anyone taking it. You know, those were during the days during the Depression when dollars meant very, very much. 
Marlin felt that everything he did was an opportunity to learn. In 1928, when a near-fatal Gabon viper bite sidelined him for several weeks, Marlin documented his experience in a journal because he felt this information could someday help in the treatment of snake bites. At the age of 23, Marlin was already gaining recognition from the press as the young snake man from the St. Louis Zoo. Marlin's reputation spread far beyond the confines of the St. Louis Zoo, and in 1938, after 12 years, he left to become the curator of the Buffalo Zoo in New York. At Buffalo, Marlin was determined to increase the popularity of the zoo. To do this, he exploited some of the animals, dressed them in human clothes, and made them entertainers. Well, when I was growing up in North Buffalo, where the Buffalo Zoo was located, uh, I remember vividly uh, uh, experiencing Marlin with his um, friendly Eddie the Chimp, who would perform in Delaware Park for all the children. Uh, he did that several times a day, uh, and obviously made uh, Eddie a very popular animal, and perhaps one of the most popular animals the zoo has ever had. I think the bad zoos, and there were a lot of them, are gradually being phased out, and the major zoos, the good zoos, are making um, much more emphasis on education. Conservation and education is, is their thrust now more than it used to be. I personally have mixed feelings about zoos. Some days I think they're a necessary evil. Sometimes I think they're an unnecessary evil. Uh, in Tyson uh, enclosures here, we have the wolves that are part of an endangered species protection program. And I regard them as being in protective custody. Here we are preserving a very rare gene pool. So we need to, in some instances, take endangered species out of where they're living and keep them in, in living zoos, if you wish. In 1944, disenchanted with the politics of running the zoo and disappointed in promised raises he never got, Marlin made a decision that would have enormous impact on his world and the world of his beloved animals. I was talking to the Parks Commissioner, who was Parks Commissioner when Marlin was in Buffalo, and I believe if for a modest $300, which they would not give him the raise, he decided he'd leave Buffalo. Penny wise and pound foolish, they say, right? He resigned his position in Buffalo to become assistant director at the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. Soon Marlin became director when Floyd Young retired. The Lincoln Park Zoo was uh, meeting the needs of the Chicagoland public very adequately, but I think it was uh, just a question that it was an adequate uh, zoo at that time. But I think that Marlin was able to elevate the performance of this zoo, take those first steps to elevating the image of this zoo in the, with the uh, Chicagoland public. He seized an opportunity that most zoo directors at the time would not have taken, a move that spurred the evolution of wildlife conservation. The zoo man went on television. Marlin began hosting a weekly show on WBKB in Chicago. He and his animal friends became some of Chicago's first on-air personalities. During this time, he met producer Don Meyer, who would become one of Marlin's greatest allies in his efforts to tell people about animals. When Marlin and WBKB parted company, it wasn't long before he and Don Meyer created a new opportunity. Hi there, this is Jim Hurlba speaking and welcoming you to our 166th Zoo Parade program. And this is the first Zoo Parade program we've ever done in the rain and it ought to be fun. But the man to show us the monkeys yeah. and tell us all about them, of course, is Marlon Perkins, director of the Lincoln Park Zoo. Hello there, I'm glad you could join us again today. 
Ginger, when you lived in the jungles in South America, where did you... Wait a minute, I want to ask you a question. When you lived down in the jungles in South America, where did you go when it rained? Huh? Did you get back under a great big leaf or someplace where the, where the rain couldn't reach you? Zoo Parade, broadcast live from the zoo, soon became one of the most popular shows on television. Schedule today, rain or not. It wasn't enough just to say that an animal did this or that. He wanted to show people uh, what animals did. He would take people behind the scenes, in a sense, not only of the zoo, but also in the uh, conservation arena where people were doing research work and so on. It was uh, his desire to, to attract the uh, citizen's attention, uh, whether it was through video or whether it was in the zoo itself. And once he had their attention, he would then try to uh, elevate their concerns, their uh, interest in conservation. Oh, oh, Bill found something and I ran over to help him. Had to help him get it out underneath that old clump of uh, brush there. Oh, it's a beautiful Florida king snake. So, Bill, let's uh, drop that one in the bag. And he goes on back to the Lincoln Park Zoo, along with all the other specimens. And uh, I'd, I'd like now to show you what that fine big king snake looks like, Jim. Here he is, the same specimen that we took out from underneath there. Zoo Parade began as a live show, which meant that things could, and often did, go wrong. Once, 15 minutes before airtime, Marlin was rehearsing with a rattlesnake, and it bit him. He and the snake missed the show that day, but a week later, he was back on the air, using this opportunity to educate people about snakes. If I can get him to open his mouth here, come on, boy, let's see what you can do here. Now, if I can open his mouth with these tweezers, I, there is a, a delicate tissue covering the fang. And if I lift that up, then I think you can see the uh, bone fangs, the actual teeth, hollow teeth, of a living rattlesnake as they're being held up here uh, by this uh, pair of tweezers. Marlin used every avenue available to him to increase the popularity of zoos, of zoo parade, and of the animal kingdom. He wrote books, comic books, a newspaper column, and even developed a board game based on Zoo Parade. Producer Don Meyer saw an opportunity for even greater educational impact for Zoo Parade. He convinced NBC that the show should go on the road, and it did. This is British East Africa. This is the Serengeti Plain. This is the camp of the Zupere Safari. Hi there. Well, one of our great dreams has finally been realized. Take Zuparade on safari in Africa. We set up our safari camp here at the edge of the Serengeti Plains in Tanganyika Territory. And Marlon Perkins is just over there right now. We're going out to join him. Hello there. Well, here I am, finally out on the Serengeti Plains in British East Africa. I'm standing here right in the middle of these plains, looking out over grass that it goes out here, waving prairie grass that feeds these vast herds of animals. You know, there are animals out there right now, but they're so far away from me, I can't see them plainly with my naked eye, and I need a pair of binoculars. Well, Jim Herbert promised to bring a pair of binoculars with him. And here he comes now. Hi, uh, Marlon. Hi, uh, Jim. I see you brought your binoculars all right. Yeah, I sure did, Marlon. Mighty good ones, too. Yeah? Say, Jim, there's some animals moving right out there on the plains, but I can't see them well enough. Would you put your binoculars on them and tell me what sure. they are, please? Gee, there's a big herd of them out there.
Jim, Jim, let me have the binoculars, would you? Right, sure. Let me just borrow them for a minute. Marlon and Don believed very strongly that showing the audience the world would increase awareness and educate people about their growing concern for wildlife. That brings this story to a close, so this is Jim Halbert saying goodbye for the Zoo Parade Safari in Africa. But while the show filmed on location, the Chicago Park District and NBC were feuding about the division of Marlon's time as Zoo Parade host and Zoo Director. Marlin's critics believed that his second career detracted from his main responsibilities of running the zoo. There's a lion's footprint. Contract that disputes be between really Zoo Parade, the off. zoo, and NBC were the settled, and Marlin continued his dual role as director and television host. Many felt this was the best possible combination. People sometimes have asked me, how has the zoo profession or people's outlook on zoos Change. And I always say one thing, Zoo Parade. I mean that, if Marlon did anything in his lifetime, and he did many things, he put before the American public zoos, and he popularized them. He didn't trivialize them, he really made them popular. Marlon knew that children loved the thrill of discovery, and he could also see that they would have to assume responsibility for the welfare of the animal kingdom in the future. So he looked for ways to prepare them for that responsibility. He was very interested in educating people of all ages, and certainly children, because he realized that conservation is a long-term project. You have to start when children are young. And he was one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, first, I think, in zoological parks to uh, recognize that and work to that end. The, the way that I would travel with him, for example, I went on a, a, one of the trips I went on with, uh, to him with, Af with him to Africa. Uh, we would uh, walk around or look uh, for animals, and he, he was uh, often not overly directive. That is to say, uh, he allowed you to, to find out things for yourself. I think that diaper is a very practical thing. Well, it's the prevention. Yes, after one experience, that uh, we just couldn't take a chance again. Now you leave the microphone alone. There isn't anything about a microphone that uh, that you would like to prey upon. Over the years, uh, Zoo Parade won many awards, animal. including well, best no, children's no, show, no, best really educational no, show, no, and no, best no, family no, viewing. No, and as exciting as his work on Zoo Parade had been, Marlon says that the most important thing in his life happened after Zoo Parade was canceled. He married Carol Morse Cotsworth. I met him a long time ago uh, in Buffalo, New York, when we were both happily married, and uh, he was the director of the Buffalo Zoo. And then uh, the, he moved to Chicago, and we moved to Connecticut. And uh, then uh, time passed, quite a bit of time, uh, oh, years, actually. And so then I was alone with three children, and he was alone with, uh, and Suzanne was grown and getting married. And we met again in Chicago and uh, decided to get married. Carol became the accomplice that Marlon needed. Obviously, they were an extraordinary couple. The passion that he and she had together made one big explosion of passion for living and for living things. Soon after they were married, however, Carol was to get a glimpse of what life with Marlon Perkins was really going to be like. Right after we were married, within a month, actually, after we were married, uh, Marlon went to the Himalayas with Sir Edmund Hillary. Well, one of the objectives of the expedition was the, to try and work out a little bit about the abominable snowman, the Yeti. So off they went, and uh, 
as I say, it was within a month that we were married, and we always joked that he had his honeymoon with Sir Edmund Hillary. Marlon delighted in his role in the expedition and saw it as a tremendous opportunity to uncover more information about the natural world. He was 55 years old at the time, and he hardly considered the fact that this could be a perilous journey. Marlin's journals were detailed, professional observations of the expedition, but sometimes it was apparent that the Yeti was not the only thing on his mind. My darling loves me, five letters from Carol today. I think he came to the conclusion, uh, the same conclusion that I came to in the end, that really the Yeti was pretty much a mythological creature. Uh, I think we came to the conclusion that uh, it probably didn't exist. When the expedition ended, Marlin returned home to his family and his work at Lincoln Park. He also continued his friendship with Don Meyer. Neither Don nor Marlin was ready to give up on the educational potential of television. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by the company with coverage for everyone. The greatest name in health insurance, Mutual of Omaha. From Chicago's world-famous Lincoln Park Zoo, here is Marlon Perkins with today's adventure, Hunters of the Sky. Well, that wasn't ex exactly the way I'd planned it. I was going to have him fly directly to my fist instead of onto my head. And now I'd like to welcome you to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. You know, you got to realize that in these days there was really no market for wildlife footage. And everyone told Don Meyer he was a fool to try this. He, it took him six years to sell the idea and get a sponsor. And he got Mutual again, who had been a previous sponsor. And uh, we came on the air in 1962. Uh, I remember the title of the first film ever done for Wild Kingdom, the pilot film. It was called Attack and Defense. It's rather interesting that even then they knew that some of the people that, uh, that bought television shows and sponsored them in New York certainly understood how animals attack and defend themselves, but uh, a lot of action, a lot of action in that film. Wild Kingdom found an immediate audience. Marlon and Jim brought a message that was new to most people in the early 60s. Marlon realized that this message was long overdue. People were ready for uh, this. They had sort of been primed and their minds were ready. Wild Kingdom came on the air in 1962. Rachel Carson wrote a book called The Silent Spring in 1962. And I think there was a synergism there that really got things stirred up and uh, perking along when we started out. I couldn't even use the word environment without explaining what it was. Every time we used the word habitat, we'd have to sort of in parentheses say what we're talking about. And uh, now these are, are in our lexicon that people understand them. Marlon had the insight to know that the way you the big picture is to try to affect public attitudes and make people care, and the way you do that is to show them, show them the world. started filming in Africa. My wife and I went to Africa. We carried all our equipment, 
uh, with us. Within our, in those days, we had an 88 pound baggage limit. We carried our cameras and everything with us within, within that limit. And all these people who were regulars uh, really had a work ethic. And uh, I think one of the things that maybe the average uh, viewer would not pick up on is how much work it was, uh, was really involved in putting these shows together. I drove the car for Warren primarily and tried to get him a position to get good shots. And um, I did the shopping for food for us and helped set up tents and did the cooking. And sometimes I would run a second camera when Warren needed one. Uh, I did the sound when we were doing sync sound. I always did that. On location, often the lights would burn, sometimes kerosene lanterns, sometimes candles, till way into the night, making sure equipment was, was taken care of and maintained and cleaned and making sure that all the film was labeled. A lot of hard work involved. As dedicated and hardworking as the Wild Kingdom crew proved to be, they did find time to apply their energies to other pursuits. I remember on several occasions, uh, late at night, some of us decided to go out and try to catch uh, African giant porcupine with our bare hands. To do that, you've got to get on the front of a Land Rover. I mean, obviously, this was uh, after work hours, and uh, sometimes it was after a few beers. I'll have to admit, on one occasion, I remember very specifically that we started seeing fresh lion tracks. That made us change our perspective in a hurry. If there is one word that defines filming in the bush, it is unpredictable. As was proven the night the crew had a baby giraffe penned near their tents. But that night, a big storm came up and a lot of lions apparently came into camp, unknown to us. Anyway, the storm came up, and that night, uh, the elephants were also in the area. And all of a sudden, above the sounds of the storm, the elephants started screaming and running through our camp. We didn't know it at the time, but they were chasing some lions that had tried to kill the giraffe. I remember distinctly trying to make a decision. Did I stay inside the tent or go outside? Well, Marlon and I both ended up outside the tent. I think the, some of the other people stayed inside but I would rather see what's happening. And Carol remembers that very well. I remember she and Marlon had some real discussions on this point, you know, what, what should they do? I've worried about him all the time. That's why I wanted to be there, because it's not as scary, you know, when you're there. And I could always say, be careful, you know, and feel that I was doing my duty. He paid no attention to it. Uh, but no, every time he left, Without me, uh, he, the cab would come and get him, and I always watched it thinking, you know, maybe I won't see him again. Meeting Marlon was meeting this very dignified, lovely man who, with his warmth, and then you met his wife, Carol, and she was the perfect balance, her humor and her dignity, but the humor trickling through all the time. Well, there's no question, no question that Marlon was a, uh very much of a family person. I mean, he talked about his family all the time, and he had to, he had to have his family uh, with him. And of course, Carol, it was rather interesting that Carol essentially, uh, she realized that she wanted to be with Marlon on a lot of these trips, and she insisted on it. I admire her for that. So he married me, not believing that I knew everything. He thought everybody knew everything. And so I think it was um, a surprise to us both when Wild Kingdom developed and uh, it was time for me to go with him and he realized that maybe I didn't know as much as he thought I did and then I realized that I had to do a crash course in some of these things so that I could understand and appreciate the things that we were doing. He explained to me about screaming that it would scare the animals. You, you know, don't scream, because it would upset the animals. And then he felt he ought to tell me something else. He said, uh, when he realized maybe I didn't know everything, he said, if you see a, a lion or a bear or a tiger when we're out, he said, don't run, because they'll think you're prey and they'll chase you. So I took that in. And once I had mastered, you know, not screaming and not running, 
Well, then I was home free. I was ready to go into all the jungles. Although some things haven't changed in the African bush, much has. In the 30 years since Marlon, Jim, Warren, and Jenny first filmed along the Zambezi River in this part of Zimbabwe, much of the wildlife has disappeared. Poaching is, is, has continued to increase, particularly in the last decade. Um, we had a population of black rhino approximately 8,000 a decade ago. We're now less than 500 animals in the Zambezi Valley. I don't know the accurate figures anymore, but we're losing animals on a regular basis. Um, the elephant are, are still being poached in this area, and as a result, they've moved further inland and away from the river areas. Um, it, it is a big concern. We don't have enough or sufficient manpower to patrol these areas, and the equipment and the costs involved in protecting wildlife species is an issue. Um, and yes, very much so, the poaching continues, and it's a major threat to a lot of species in this country. This appalling decline can be measured day by day, week by week. It is happening that quickly. Yet enough still exists worldwide to inspire within us a glimmer of hope that grows stronger each day. Do you want to go in there? Sure. And have a look. It's probably one of the small, small animals, more general animals. Look up, look above then you. Then it would be a sleeper. Look above you. Oh, wow. But I think it looks as if a couple of holes through there. Then the elephants came along and, and pulled oh, the bark no. off, and I think the pigs must have come in. Mm -hmm. But they would have come all the way from, from the bottom. Now. I like my family. Yeah. They're Very all, nice. they're nice, aren't they? They all get along, and they're friendly, and they're fun. And, here, have a chocolate. They were by my bed. <laughs> we took our children to Africa and, you know, everywhere, and I wanted the grandchildren, now that they're uh, old enough, I, before they all scattered, you know, I wanted them all to have this time together to uh, see where we spent so much of our lives and to understand why we loved it so much, because uh, all their lives, you know, we were always somewhere. and. Uh, I just wanted them to see what their grandfather did and how much we loved it and to appreciate all the things that were out there. Okay. All right. Um, everybody, please keep behind me. Feel free to take photographs, pictures, anything you like. And if I tell you to stop taking pictures, please do that. Try not to take the last minute picture when the elephant is right above you or the lion is here. Okay. All right. While few of us will actually trek the high veldt of Africa or dive along the great <laughs> reef off Australia, most of us have traveled with Marlon and his companions. We have joined in the adventure and examined the riddles of the wild. That is Marlon's gift. What we do with that gift is up to us. In 1962, the St. Louis Zoo offered Marlin the opportunity to come home and be zoo director. After 18 years at Lincoln Park Zoo, he moved his new family to the city that had launched his career as a zoo man. As zoo director, or Wild Kingdom host, Marlin's role as educator remained foremost in his mind. I think he was 
proudest of being a zoo director. That was his life. He always thought of himself as a zoo director uh, to care for animals and to keep them alive and to find out the best ways that they could breed and how to save them in the wild. And I think beyond that, it was the fact that he educated so many people to appreciate animals. I think that was the greatest satisfaction he ever had, was thinking that he was helping a whole generation grow up to appreciate animals and their environment. Having premiered in 1962, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom became the longest running series in television history. The program featured action and adventure while still sending Marlin's message of concern and conservation. We had to do a lot of competition in the early days with uh, series like football. That's one of the reasons why we started off with some of the kind of heavy action shows that we did. And also the other thing is that by Marlon Perkins and myself and others actually being on location and, and taking part in these adventures, the viewer, I think, sort of vicariously was pulled into this as a participant. And that's an element that Wild Kingdom has had that no other program that I know of has, has been uh, so thoroughly involved in, you know, the participation of the viewer through adventure. And contrary to some popular jokes at the time, Jim wasn't the only one out wrestling alligators. Jim's out wrestling the alligator and Marlon's sitting back in camp watching, and that's not true. Marlon was out there doing things just as daring as anything Jim did. The anaconda was uh, on a log, as I remember it. And I set up on the opposite side of the pond. And the snake slid into the, into the pond. And uh, Stan Marlin went in there to get him. And it was a, a muddy pond. Um, it was uh, not terribly deep, but they uh, got in there. And trying to stand up was horrible. And it was a lot of thrashing. And poor old Marlin, I was trying to hold up this 200 pound muscular thing that was just thrashing all over. And of course, it was throwing him back into the water. And it was a, uh, that's the one scene the more people remember than any, any other we ever filmed. Warren is filming the whole thing. He never jumped in to save them because, you know, he was going to get this great footage of Marlin and Stan being drowned by an anaconda. And it always surprised him, it was interesting for him, that that was everybody's favorite show where he nearly got killed. <laughs> they thought that was a great show. When I first met Marlon, I thought he was not the rugged outdoor kind of guy I was used to. I grew up among cowboys, and they were all sort of tan and leathery skinned, and that's not like Marlon, so. He wasn't as rugged as most of the people I knew, but he he would, as they say, he would do to ride the river with. Because of the excitement and incredible images that Wild Kingdom brought to the television screen, some people accused Marlon and Don Meyer of staging things, of not being realistic. Actually, there's a tremendous difference between staging something, recreating it, and faking something. The thing that I like to point out is that uh, our Wild Kingdom show had never had any elements of being faked. We might sometimes move, let's say, a carcass at a water hole. If we wanted to make sure that elephants would come down and have a conflict with a pride of lions, but that's still showing real behavior. Only when 
I got to the ground did I have time to realize what a struggle that condor had given me. I had had to concentrate too much on the condor's sharp beak in trying to avoid its vicious bite. Wild Kingdom had more influence on uh, people's thinking about conservation and the ecology than any single entity in the world. The action and adventure did bring in a large audience for Wild Kingdom, but ironically, because of its success, Marlin's critics argued that he had neglected his role as a zoo man in favor of fame and fortune as a television star. Off in the world of science, sometimes are, are, are a little bit reluctant to get out before the public and become, um, you might say, uh, deliverers of public information. Carl Sagan has, has had some criticism from his scientific community. And Marlon Perkins certainly also had some not serious criticism, but there were some people that said that a zoo director should stay home and attend to the zoo animals. And of course, there's nothing further from the truth. Marlon brought many experiences from the Wild Kingdom back to his zoos. These experiences helped him to find innovative ways to improve not only zoo structures, but the ways in which animals are treated as well. From my understanding, Marlin's approach to keeping animals in captivity was that there, it's not just a huge stamp collection. The, the more species that you have, the greater is the zoo. He did try to emphasize using these animal exhibits for educational purposes. I believe there used to be a chimpanzee tea party and other hideous entertainment things at St. Louis Zoo, uh, which was, I'm sure, imported from the European zoos. Now, to my knowledge, uh, Marlin abolished all of that at St. Louis Zoo and put increasing emphasis upon education. Marlin retired as St. Louis Zoo director in 1970, but continued to devote his time to educating people through Wild Kingdom. At its height, it aired in over 100 countries. Wild Kingdom continues to be broadcast across the globe. But Marlin didn't think Wild Kingdom was enough. The Wild Canid Research and Survival Center and the World Bird Sanctuary are just two of the many conservation projects owing much to the support and expertise of both Marlin and Carol Perkins. It was a natural evolution of things to say, well, let's get the Wild Canid Survival and Research Center established here. It's a good, safe place, and uh, let's work within the community, get the wolf spirit alive in St. Louis. And it is a tribute, especially to Carol and uh, Marlon, that we have this going. Well, I think, really, the initial stages of development of the World Bird Sanctuary when it was in its infancy. Uh, had it not been for Marlin, I don't think we probably would have continued because certain times you're, you're, you're hit by adversity and, and you're tired and you're just worn out. Sometimes you feel, I can't, can't keep going. And then he would sit down and, and tell you a story or explain to you, well, you know, this is going to be tough, but things will get better and don't let it get you down. And, you know, that, that was important to me. And it also was a, a, a big boon to a lot of our staff. Uh, he was always learning, uh, always gracious, um, and very much an explorer at heart.
this is an absolute fact that everything depends on something else. And when we destroy any section of that whole chain of life, you're destroying things all the way down the line and it might not show up right away, but it will, it will show up. And that's what Marlon felt was so important about people learning these things and why he wanted to film all these shows and do all the things that he did. You know, we, we worked hard. Uh, he worked hard. You know, he was gone all the time. And that's why I always went with him because it was the only way I could see him. I went along. Uh, but he just felt that it was necessary to teach all these things. On June 14, 1986, the natural world lost its hardest worker and best friend. Marlon left behind as his legacy millions of us who are better prepared to be stewards of a kingdom that will always need our care and protection. If we humans don't understand very clearly why the rainforest is important to us, or if we don't understand why the African elephant is important to us, I'm not so sure we're going to save it. And so we have the next step to take is to start talking about what are the strong arguments for saving wildlife and wilderness. Uh, one of the most strong arguments, the strongest argument of all today is based on economics. Uh, the old saying, if it pays, it stays, is very true with wildlife now. And that's something that has happened that we were not aware of in the early days of Wild Kingdom. One thing that we did not point out, and no one is pointing out this, the politicians avoid it like the plague, is that our big problem right now is population. And no one addresses that problem. And until we do, there is probably no way we are going to save a lot of these species. We are getting more and more conscious in this country of animals. There are lots of places in the world, unfortunately, where they're, they're not doing as well. Again, because of the, the population balances and because people have to, have to live and they just keep crowding them. I think he would be very sorry about the, the displacement of animals in his beloved Africa, about the terrible things that are being done to the rainforest these days and, and the waste and then one day we'll look back and say, oh, we shouldn't have done that. Isn't that terrible? I think those things would worry him deeply. We have not spent enough time talking about what arguments are powerful enough to save wildlife and wilderness. Is it quality of life? Is it economics? Is it just the thrill of seeing an eagle fly and making sure our children can have that experience. We need to start looking at that very carefully. I wish that Marlin was here to carry on what I think we were all coming to regard now as World War III. The war to save the wolf, to save the planet, and in the process, save humanity from increasing suffering and desecration and deprivation of the life and beauty of this planet. But he's with us in spirit, and I'm thankful for that.
Marlon never got discouraged. I was the one who got discouraged. He always felt that there was hope, but I, I got terribly discouraged. And Marlon found a little quotation that he pasted on my mirror where I had to see it every morning. And it said, I am only one, but I am someone. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And so I had to look at that every day, you know, so I went back to work. <laughs> no, he didn't think anyone should quit. Funding for The Zoo Man has been provided by the Arthur and Helen Bear Foundation and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding has been provided by Jane Hunter McMillan.